Let the meltdown begin. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network. Let's do this thing. I am Gabriel Morenci. We've got a strong show put together for you this evening. Mark Pavlich, MFC president on the radar. John Ramdeen, Fight Network's John Ramdeen will join me in studio. Joey Odessa will join us from Costa Rica as Cain Velasquez and Fabricio Verdum are officially going head to head as coaches on the Ultimate Fighter Latin America. They're going to conclude with a fight in Mexico. We'll break that down with Joey Odessa. We got a Bellator card uh, this Friday, and we got some kick ass videos of the week. All that and more on tonight's MMA Meltdown. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. Thanks to John Ramdeen for joining us in studio. Joey Odessa will join us from Costa Rica in a couple of minutes. We'll get to our videos of the week, uh, but let's send it to Edmonton, Edmonton Alberta where uh, one of our favorite guests uh, joins us, president and founder of uh, MFC, Mark Pavlich, steps up. And then, Mark, it's always a pleasure, man. How you doing? Hey, Gabe, I tell you, but it sounds like I'm bragging all the time, so I'll just say I'm doing okay. <laughs> you're doing just okay. Uh, you're probably doing a little bit better than okay. You know, when, when people ask me how I'm doing, I say the same thing. I say okay, but I think they're tired of me telling them I'm raging and I hate everybody, so I just tell them okay as well. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Mark, we got uh, crowned uh, kings uh, coming up. You got a couple of championship fights on this card. Tell us about what's going on, man, on the ninth. Well, you got you got Sam Elby making his uh, you know first title defense. You got Kurt Southern versus Tom Galecki. The first fight was an absolute war. It went back and forth. You know, Southern was putting it on him, and then Galecki ended up choking him out. Um, the rematch is on for the title now. Uh, you know, on May 9th. And, you know, you've got Shane Campbell from K1, Marcus Edwards, the return of Victor Valimaki. Um, like I said, you know, you got Aaron Gallant, who's got the fastest knockout in MSC history. Um, you know, it's just like I said, it, it, it's my type of card. It's the type of card that I want to see. Um, this is my 40th show, and I basically match made it the way I want to watch MMA. And I'm, I've pretty much guaranteed the fans that they're going to see the most electrifying fight card in the history of Canada outside of Zufa organization. No question in my mind. For the first time in, in 15 years, I can say that, and I, and I really mean it, because the way I match this card up, it is going to be carnage from one end to the next. Half the card's going to the hospital, half the card's going to the after party. Mark my words. I'll, be, I'll Instagram that for you on May 9th. And, uh, you know, Mark, you, you've had some great cards over the years. And as you stated, you put together fights that you know are going to be entertaining fights uh, between guys that are both going to bring it. And that's what fight fans want to see. But it seems to me that this current roster that you've had, you guys have really been on a roll, let's say, in the last five or six cards or so, Mark, in which, Correct. you know, it's tough that, and I'm not just saying this because you're on, but I see it in the social media world in which people are like, wow, did you see that MFC card last night? That was pretty crazy. And then you sort of, you know, up it up uh, or ramp it up a notch for the next card. And Sam Alvey, I don't think the guy's been in a boring fight in his life. No, listen, Gabe, I've been telling people for 15 years, there's an organization out there. We know they're the biggest in the world, and that's all great and all. But there's not just one brand of MMA in the world. And I've been standing here for 15 years on my soapbox letting everybody know that we're in existence. And people know now. That's the beauty of it. Not just in Canada, but throughout the United States, throughout the world. We have fans from all over the place. And the reason why is because people want to have that little engine that could Rocky one two three four five. That Daniel Bryant, and that's who we are. We're the Daniel Bryant of MMA. I mean, that's how it is. People, 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 people know that now. You know, because they say, you know, what's funny? We're the only organization in the world that never. You know what? Like I said, we we know that the UFC is the biggest show on the planet, and it's just going to be that way. But you know what bothers people, Gabe? We've never bowed down to them. We never curtsied. At, you know, we never did that to them. So people get annoyed by that. But we're going to keep doing it. If we're in this business 10 more days, 10 more years, 10 more months, I don't know, man. But we're never going to bow down. And that's one thing the 99.9% .9 of the other MMA organizations in the world can't say. You know, and you look, you look at the UFC, and as you stated, no one's going to argue that the UFC, you know, is, is the biggest mixed martial arts company in the world. But at the same point in time, Mark, and you're a Vegas guy. 
I look at the UFC sort of like, you know, Club Encore, you know, or, you know, Excess at Encore mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. over at the mm -hmm. win or something. But that doesn't mean that everybody else on the strip isn't having a great time at the clubs that they're at, right? You know, hey, hey Gabe, it's like going over to the Hard Rock, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's on, like, on a Saturday, tell me you're not having fun. And I'm telling you, the MFC's applied for the Nevada license, is in the process of applying for the Nevada license. And, and the casino that we're in talks with is the Hard Rock. So it's, it's interesting how you made that analogy today, because you're right. There's, there, there's a different taste for people. We've always separated ourselves from, we've always believed that MMA should be in a ring and not a cage. That's our opinion. We think it's better for the fans for viewing. We think it, it promotes more action. That's just been well, our Well, you're selling the, the steak, right? Years. You're selling it's the steak. You're, you're in Alberta. We'll put it in beef uh, terms. You're selling the steak. And I understand some companies are selling the sizzle, but the problem is at times there's too much sizzle on the plate and not enough steak on the plate. And I, I think a lot of fight fans that, that watch your events on TV, Mark, and the, the fight fans that are going... Uh, to, to the Shaw Conference Center to see this stuff live. They just want to see good fights. They don't need to be told that these two guys are the best two in the world, when we know they're not, you know, or, you know, the, 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 the constant hype. People want to see fights. And I think sometimes some promoters forget that. They get caught up in stuff. Let's bring in this chick versus this chick. You know, what does it mean in the fight world? Nothing. But, hey, we'll make some money off of it. I, I want to see fights, man. You know, that, that's what it's about. Gabe, if we're, Gabe, if we're going to watch horse racing, you think I care? I want to watch horses race. I want to see them run. I want to when I watch when I watch boxing. I'm the same way. I want to see guys beat the crap out of each other. Call me a hopeless romantic, but that's what I want to watch. All right. <laughs> Some would say say this. People, when did we when did we lose track of all this? Right. I want to watch the maximum fighting championship, and I'm telling everybody on May 9th from the Shaw Conference Center, live on Access TV, Ticketmaster.ca, that if you see it live. You come to me after and you tell me that I'm not telling I'm telling you exactly what's going to happen on May 9th and that's and that's what people want to see. They want to see brutal violence in a controlled atmosphere and they want to see people bringing it. They want to see one guy, you know, taking it to the deep end and then the other guy reversing it and then he comes out as victorious. What is wrong with people? That's what I want to watch. And when you got people like Sam Elvey, Marcus Edwards, Victor Valimaki, um, all these guys on one fight card, that's what's going to happen. Tune in, everybody. See if I'm a liar. And uh, Andrew McInnes as well, um, you know, an, an up-and-coming uh, grappler that there's a lot of hype uh, about a Canadian fighter. Unfortunately, we got to wrap it up already, uh, Mark. And we're on a short leash today with, with the clock. So in about 30, 45 seconds here, Anthony Burchak, when's he going to be back? Well, he just got injured, right? And that's unfortunate because he's been the poster child for the Maximum Fighting Championship. But that, that kid's resilient. There's no question. One of the best 135-pounders in the world. Current MFC champ. He'll be back, you know, stronger than ever. And, you know, I'm not worried about Anthony. He'll, he'll rebound back for sure. It's uh, MFC 40 Crown Kings, uh, May 9th, Access Television, and live in Edmonton, Alberta. Mark, it's always a pleasure, my man. Thanks for having me on, Gabe. I really appreciate it. There's a Mark Pavlich uh, with us. We'll get to our videos of the week, and we'll send it to Costa Rica, crunch some numbers with the best odds maker in the business, Joey Odessa. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I am Gabriel Morenci. We welcome John Ramdeen to the program. John, it's always a pleasure. How you doing? I'm doing A-OK. -okay. Thanks for having me on. Well, uh, John, ton of stuff uh, that I want to get to with you, so let's uh, dive right in. Uh, John Jones. John Jones, a spectacular performance against Glover Teixeira. A lot of people legitimately believe that Glover Teixeira was going to provide the toughest test to John Jones, even more so than what Alexander Gustafson uh, provided right here in our backyard in Toronto. I didn't feel that way going into this fight. Uh, as you know, John, you know, styles make matchups, right? And stylistically, John Jones and Gustafson, I think it's just a tough matchup for John Jones because he's not used to fighting someone with the same body shape and size 
as uh, he is, but he just dominated uh, Glover Teixeira, didn't he? Just dominated. Yeah, I mean, he looks sensational. And, you know, you look at that Gustafson fight, and it's like, yes, he has the same type of frame as John Jones. Jones has never dealt with a guy as, as long, as rangy as Alexander Gustafson. But I think that, you know, you look at this fight with Teixeira, and I think that he matched up in certain areas better than Alexander Gustafson. Number one, he had the experience. You know, he's battle-tested. We saw that John Jones was labeling this guy with elbows throughout the contest and I think a lot of fighters would have just given up but Teixeira just proved the toughness that I mean we saw the toughness in and uh, Gustafson as well but, but offensively Glover was just a step slow reminded me that, of Bane and Batman in the scene when they're on the steps and Bane's throwing these haymakers but he's a step slow he keeps missing and that's what I think what it came down to is uh that Teixeira just didn't have the speed to contend with John Jones, and I think that's, uh, you know, when he when they got into the exchanges, especially up against the cage, we saw Teixeira land a number of those hooks, and, you know, some landed cleanly, but it, again, a testament to John Jones's toughness. People are, you know, for the last year or two saying John Jones will not be able to take a punch. That's why he utilizes movement. He doesn't get so close, but I think we saw that he could take a punch just fine. Is there is there a bigger gap in any weight division? What weight division do you think is the biggest gap between the champion and the contenders? I I think right now it's a it's a good time for a number of different divisions you look at of course the late heavyweight division with John Jones you look at the flyweight division Demetrius Johnson ruling that with an iron fist because I look at Demetrius Johnson as the clear number one guy at 125 you don't, pounds you, what about Bagatinov yeah, but, uh, just uh, another guy that they're throwing in there to you, fight him you know I, I think that you look at um uh, Joseph Benavidez as the number two guy in the division. He's just so ridiculously talented. Weidman might be a lot better than everybody else, too, yeah, right? And maybe, but again, you look but we at... We don't know because he hasn't fought uh, enough. Exactly, and you look at some of the matchups stylistically. What happens if Chris Weidman goes up against Jacare, for example? How will he deal with a grappler that has the abilities that uh, the Brazilian has? So I look at uh, John Jones, I look at Demetrius Johnson, and I look at uh, Jose Aldo. I think those guys are kind of really at the cream of the crop and the number two guy is so much further down and then you look at the guys that are even further and down. We can't forget Kane. Of course. But Kane. I'm just, I look at John Jones and you know, Kane Velasquez, I don't get the feeling that he's going to lose, but he has recently lost. Yeah. He has recently lost and I'm looking, in, I'm, I'm intrigued by the fight against Verdum. Most champions you go in, there's a chance. You think, you know, there's a shot this guy. You know, I don't really get that feeling with John Jones. It's too bad his personality rubs people the wrong way like it does, in my opinion. There were people cheering, though, which uh, even John Jones said he was surprised that people were actually rallying behind Only him. Only because there were Brazilians in the house. <laughs> and they, they started to get some Brazilian chants, so the USA, <laughs> USA. When it, you know, that's what saves his ass here, the fact that he's American. That, that got him through it. But a dominant performance... Before we move on from John Jones uh, here, are you, because some people, and Joey Odessa, who's going to join me a little bit later on, I got a ton of respect for Joey, he's been making odds since UFC won, that's right. He was making odds when dudes were fighting in jeans wow. and Nikes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that's, he's been around a while. But Joey thinks that that night was sort of a fluke, that Jones is going to kill Gustafson in the rematch. I believe, no, that that's the one guy. This He could be the kryptonite here. I give Gustafson a great chance to beat Jones, despite what I just saw against Teixeira. Which camp are you in? That Jones, you know, wasn't on top of his game that night and will, will be much better this time around? Or, you know, because some people are saying Gustafson gave everything that he had and he fell short. He won't be able to do that again. Which camp are you in? I actually subscribe to the John Jones theory in the sense that, uh, you know, John Jones... Nobody had really pushed him up until that point. You look at his other, his loss was against Matt Hamill. Yeah, he'd never a, a really been hit. Exactly. He'd been hit solitary-wise, but with combos, with elbows, etc. Yes. So this, uh, Alexander Gustafson pushed John Jones to the limit. And, you know, John Jones, says, I'm sure he sat back and thought to himself, wow, I didn't know... I would be able to get hurt like that. I didn't know I'd be able to be pushed to that limit. This is now going to elevate John Jones' game. But what about, John, what about the fact that I punished Gustafson and he didn't go down like everybody else? 
he didn't stop fighting like everybody else. He didn't get tired like everybody else. What about that well, argument? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a great argument, but you also look at the fact that John Jones was hurt. So he can say, you know, maybe I didn't really give my all because I didn't expect him to deliver this type of punishment to me. I look at that fight with uh, the Glover Teixeira and John Jones, and I believe I'm seeing possibly the greatest fighter to ever compete in mixed martial arts in John Jones. Either way, I think we can agree we're looking forward to this rematch, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, looking forward to this rematch. Uh, I want to give props to John Ram, Dean, for picking Anthony Johnson to beat Phil Davis. And I'm kicking myself because I spoke to the Rammer at his cubicle here at the Fight Network uh, on Friday, and I said, what do you think about that fight? And you gave me a long list of reasons why Anthony Johnson was going to be able to beat Phil Davis, uh, some of which, you know, he's handled bigger men before. He's more powerful with his stand-up. That his takedown defense is greatly improved than it used to be. All of which were great points, John. But I just, I had in my mind that Phil Davis, if you could take Leota Machida down and out point and out Machida Machida in Brazil, that you'll be able to take Anthony Johnson down. But great performance by Anthony Johnson. Oh, yeah, sensational. And, and uh, just to talk about your point about Leota Machida. I personally had Leona Machida winning that fight. So, oh, he did win that fight. Exactly, and I think most of the people that I've spoken to, they, taught, they feel that Machida won the fight. But, you know, this is the way it works. This is the MMA scoring. The judges see it the way that they're going to see it. But I just, when I came down to looking at this fight, I looked at all the areas that Phil Davis is strong and all the areas that Anthony Johnson's strong, and I felt that Anthony Johnson was better in almost every single area, and I believed that he would have been able to stop the takedown. And if and, and if Phil Davis, I wouldn't have been surprised if Phil Davis did get a takedown or two or three or ten, but I just didn't expect him to be able to hold Anthony Johnson down and inflict any damage because that's not Phil Davis's game. He's just a guy that tries to wear on you and tr he tries to win on points, and I just didn't think he was going to be able to do that. He mentally broke Phil Davis, yeah. which is really surprising to me when we talk about NCAA competitive wrestlers, especially guys at the top of the food chain like Phil Davis, that are so damn mentally tough. You know, multiple matches in a day, the daily grind of yeah. training. That's why these wrestlers are so mentally tough. But, you know, Davis gave up on what, you know, got him there with his wrestling, was a step slow in the stand-up. And, you know, great performance by Anthony Johnson. It was frustrating to me because I didn't love Davis going into this. And... I don't like when Dana White demeans fighters, yeah. especially that he has under contract. And he did with recently with Phil Davis with the old, he's not really a fighter. You know, he's, I, I, I don't know if this guy's a real fighter. What has he really shown us? And I don't know if it was taking a pot shot at him or trying to motivate the yeah. guy, trying to light a fire under his ass. But I dare to say that Johnson was just tougher. Like one of these, you know, who's going to win in a street fight? <laughs> Anthony Johnson's going to win in a street fight. And again, we, we almost yeah. found that like, yeah, Davis, you've got no body fat. You're a great athlete. And yeah, you can be on the cover of Muscle Fitness magazine, but you're getting your ass kicked right now. Yeah, and we talked about this. I mean, Anthony Johnson being at that Black Zillions camp for so long, training with Tyrone Spong, who was possibly the best striker in mixed martial oh, yeah, arts, yeah. and who was also in Anthony Johnson's weight class, as well as Rashad Evans. And you have, again, you have to give props to the wrestling coach, Kenny Monday. And before that, it was Mike Van Arsdale. So this guy, wrestling has been a part of their camp for a long, long time. And you add to the fact that Anthony Johnson is this insane athlete himself, and it was, I mean, the guy was on a six-fight winning streak, knocked out DJ Linderman, uh, broke Andre Arlovsky's jaw. He was good to go. Speaking of Andre Arlovsky, how surprised were you to find out he's coming back It's to been the a long time. Wow, this, and it's a great matchup. But he, hasn't been win, but he hasn't been winning fights. It's one of these weird deals. Like, it's bizarre whole world. Isn't it? I'm just saying, I don't have a problem with it because I'm like you, John. I just want to see fighters fight. Yeah. I got Phil Maroney in the UFC as uh, well. Yeah, you know, it have to be a main event, yeah. but you know, yeah, I'm in. the guys that are in are in one of these deals type of yeah. stuff. But it's just very un-UFC like, yeah. isn't it? To bring it's, a guy back like Arlovsky right now. You know what? I think the UFC still knows that they need name brand guys. And I think Andre Arlovsky, maybe not for the casual fans out there, but for a lot of the hardcore fans, Give, give them Andre Orlovsky in the main event or co-main event of a fight pass card. Is it almost too like, hey, look, we don't screw all the old guys? Maybe. Because I heard rumors, actually, that if Maroney just wins a couple, 
they'll gladly put him on undercards and, and have him back just because. Sure. Just because he was part uh, of the family in the early days, the first Zufa card. But, you know, what, what I'm happy about Anthony Johnson for is, is that the UFC is such a big machine, and justifiably so, but they're such a big machine that some of the, the people that aren't really fight fans, they're UFC fans, right? Yep. You know, it's like NFL fans. You're not yeah. a football fan, you're an NFL fan. But there's a perception amongst a lot of people, John, that if you're not in the UFC, you don't exist. <laughs> like, you know, he used to be good, but now he's not good anymore. Yeah, right. But no, no, now he's suddenly good again. <laughs> like, you know, the whole, like, you know, it doesn't exist. It's, only, it's like the, you know, it's, it's the, the Western world mindset. Nothing is happening outside of North America. I mean, yeah, you know, it can't be that cool if it is. But the fact is, yes, Anthony Johnson was a good fighter when he got cut. He's a good fighter now. It's like Nick so, Diaz. And the UFC cut Nick Diaz from their roster. Yeah, so does it mean... But, like, you know you know what I'm saying, yeah, though? Like, John Fitch gets cut. Oh, he sucks. Yeah, I know. He Jake, sucks. Jake like, Shields sucks. The keyboard now. warriors, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. the guys are going to believe whatever Dana says. Oh, this guy's no good. Jake Shields, yeah. Oh, Cammy can't fight him. But you <laughs> go down the list. They all suck. <laughs> But if you brought them back and they happen to win in the UFC next time, yeah. then oh, no, they're, they're, they're back now. They're, they're back. It's true. All right, so Tito Ortiz, you're an old school guy yep. here. Tito Ortiz fighting Shlomenko, although will he? You that's know, the question. That's what, that's what everybody is saying. Will Tito actually fight Alexander Shlomenko on this pay-per-view? And, of course, I think they've done a bell tour trying to create interest. Uh, you have the main event, the lightweight championship. You have Rampage on the card. King Mo There's taking some complaints, on Rampage. Some complaints, John, about, oh, it's $45? Yeah. Hey, for Alvarez Chandler, sure. I'll, I'll pay 60 bucks gladly. Yeah. I mean, but, again, you, you have to be educated to understand – how important the first fight was, how important the second fight was, and just Eddie Alvarez's place in the Bellator organization. This guy could be gone. He could be headed over to the UFC uh, sooner rather than later. And, to, I mean, you look at uh, the card, and I, I agree with you. I'll, I'll pay for it. You have Ivanov on the card. You have Volkov, the winner of that, taking on Minikov for the title. Czech Congo's on the card. Marcin Held versus uh, Freite on the card. So it is a solid uh, event for the Bellator organization. Is it worth yeah, 45 bucks. Uh, again, it depends on who you are. Well, was was last Saturday's card worth 55 bucks? I know. Maybe, right? I, I, I don't know. It was pretty entertaining. It was. So the Bellator card could yeah, be very no, entertaining as well. Yeah. But where I'm going with this with Tito Ortiz, they showed John Jones and the amount of wins that he has in the light heavyweight division. So they showed the history of the light heavyweight division. And, you know, Chuck Liddell was 16 wins or whatever it was. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But there was an absent name in Tito Ortiz. Now, you know, we can, I understand from a business standpoint that Dana White and the UFC hate Tito Ortiz this much, that they're not going to recognize him. And with the fact that he is on a pay-per-view coming up, that they don't want to give him any name recognition whatsoever. Yet a bigger part of me looks at this and goes, this is petty as hell. And you can't rewrite the history books. Like, just because you don't like a guy doesn't mean that the guy didn't win fights in your company. Seems pretty petty to me. Like, and when I look at both sides of this, I side with, you know, what, what do you, you can't take guys out, like, to me. Because now, it's not just Tito Ortiz. You're taking out guys that he fought as well. You're yeah. just sort of erasing all the fights. Like, they never existed and they did exist. Yeah, but I don't think they, they, they care about that because they're, they're trying to create something. They're trying to inform the public of the product that they want to showcase. I mean, the reality is Frank Shamrock's not in the UFC Hall of Fame. This guy definitely should be in there. Uh, he uh, was undefeated as a middleweight champion, and the UFC doesn't want him. They don't want Ken Shamrock, a part of their organization. They pulled Randy Couture out of their uh, promos. If you, so what are you going to do? Just you know, That's what they do. They're going to take their names out of the history books, so to speak, so Randy Couture never existed? No. I, he, I, he never won those fights? I agree with you. Tito Ortiz never won the fights? Never existed? No, it, I, I know. 
it's it's insane. I to, to me, I, I I disagree with them. I think that they should, uh, whether they love the guys that fought for the organization or hate the guys, these are men that t stepped inside of the cage for them. Uh, Tito Ortiz helped uh, carry the promotion on his shoulders during the dark ages. So to me, it's it's something that you shouldn't do. Tito Ortiz should be part of the UFC's history, but uh, you know how business works. John Ramdean, check him out on the Fight Network. Uh, Rammer, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for the time. No, thank you for having me. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. Let's send it to Costa Rica, where the best damn odds maker in the business, bar none, joins us. Joey Odessa. Joey, it's always a pleasure. How you doing? Hey, what's up tonight, G? You know, we're doing all right, uh, Joey. We're doing all right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the sports world, uh, Joey. Uh, pretty much all around the NBA, uh, with the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers being taped uh, by his girlfriend and uh, some not-so-politically correct comments uh, being aired to the world on TMZ, and I was thinking to myself, uh, you know, if your wife ever really wants to get you, Joey, she's just got to uh, let the tape roll, and you'll be barred from every network uh, from here to eternity. You know, it's, it's probably true. I think, you know, I think the majority of society has said something at one time or another that they end up regretting in hindsight if it was broadcast to the world. I mean, it's kind of sad. Everybody's got a price, but I say... You know, silence makes no mistakes, and he should have he should have abided by that and thought about it. <laughs> yeah, he should have done should have done a lot of things uh, differently along the way. All right, Joey. So we had a press conference uh, yesterday about Verdum and uh, Kane. Yeah, it was no secret the Ultimate Fighter, Latin America. They're going to be fighting in Mexico, and uh, the UFC has been trying to capitalize on Kane Velasquez's Mexican heritage, but. You know, he's from Arizona. His father was from Mexico, but Kane's from Arizona. Mexico, they're into boxing, uh, Joey. You know that. I don't got to tell you that. You're a boxing guy as well. Mexicans are into boxing, and, you know, they're not into heavyweight boxing either. So now we've got a heavyweight mixed martial artist. I'm interested to see whether this takes off or not in Mexico, but not as much as I'm interested in seeing this fight, Joey, because Verdum's the real deal right now. Yeah, he looked good on his feet, but again, you know, I, I, not to take anything away from Travis Brown, but one of his biggest advantages was his size. You know, if we shrunk him down a little bit, it wasn't like he had overwhelming technique outside of those elbows that, you know, guys that are six inches shorter than him and, and trying to take, you know, shoot medium double leg takedowns on the fence just fell right into. You know, not to coach Joe it, but, you know, no two fights are the same, and we're doing what's really good on the feet against, uh, you know, against Brown. He, I guess you could say he beat him pretty much at his own game, uh, which was surprising. And that happens a lot. I mean, look at, uh, look at some of the wrestlers that come out, and all of a sudden they have a stand-up game, and then they get absorbed by the stand-up game and think that they're stand-up fighters. I mean, well, look at I, Verdun, I, I'm Joey. of the opinion they have to take a different game plan with every fight. And uh, this is one of those fights where... You know, even if Kane takes him down, you know, that's where we're doomed is most dangerous. But, you know, it's when you're taking shots, you know, from the guard, I mean, we've seen it happen before. I saw it with David Terrell back in the day. You know, when guys got on top of him, great jiu-jitsu. But, you know, when guys were in his guard, I mean, it's a lot different when guys are raining down bombs like guys like Kane. Yeah, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I think Verdum's going to beat Kane because I think Kane uh, is the best uh, heavy, heavyweight in the world by far. But you mentioned that he outboxed Travis Brown and then sort of, you know, but, you know, what skill did Travis Brown have? Don't forget, Fabrizio Verdum also outboxed Roy Nelson, Joey. And you know Roy Nelson's stand-up is pretty damn good. And that shocked me. I had Roy Nelson in that fight. It's amazing to me. You know, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And we see so many, so many you know, times, Joey, you know, these jiu-jitsu guys and the Brazilian guys, you know, they got great grappling and they got great jits, but... Their stand-up isn't very good, and it never really gets better. But it's amazing. When you look at Verdum's stand-up from when he fought Alistair Overeem, when he was flopping around on his back like, like, a, you know, like a fish, Joey, on, you know, on the beach, and he was begging you know, Overeem to, to jump down in his guard, to him outboxing Roy Nelson, to him picking apart Travis Brown... You don't see that often from guys that have been around uh, a long time, Joey, improve an aspect of their game that much. you got to give him credit. His stand-up is 150 times better right now. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I look at, uh, you know, even somebody like Gray Maynard. I mean, look at his stand-up when he, when he went in against Frankie Edgar. I mean, not to compare 100, you know, 155 pounders to heavyweights, but, you know, different fighters, different styles. That's why, I, you know, I throw a lot of the, the math, the MMA math and stuff like that and the statistics out the window because they really can be meaningless. I mean, we've seen, how many times have you seen great strikers? I mean, look at no further than uh, Phil Davis this week. Totally neutralized wrestling against... Uh, Against Anthony Johnson, I mean, it was an it was an absolute blowout. I mean, I could have even made a case for thirty to twenty six. I, you know, Phil had an off night, and you know, but then he beat Machida. He didn't beat Machida, but you know, for the record, he beat Machida officially. And you so, talk I mean, about Joey. You you talk about wrestlers that get out of their get out of their element. And it's not like Davis has great stand up, anyways. His stand up sucks. Let's be honest. His stand up. Well, yeah, it was non existent. Yeah, stand up is terrible. So why does he do it? It's not like. It's not like he can say, well, I'm this all-American wrestler, but I'm knocking people out like Hendricks. Hendricks can justify it. You know, yeah, I got the wrestling, but I'm better standing up than these guys too. So I'm going to go stand up first and then wrestling as a, as a fallback. Phil Davis has not once ever in any fight left any of us saying, wow, that was some great stand-up. That was some great boxing. That was some great striking. Yet he gave up on his wrestling, Joey. And I said this earlier in the program, and you're a wrestling guy, and it's amazing to me that Anthony Johnson broke Phil Davis's will because I thought you wrestling guys can't have your will broken. You know, with all those, you know, vicious, sick practices and multiple competitions and incessant training, Johnson broke Davis's will, Joey. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's one of those things where, I mean, guys do have off nights. I mean, we've seen some great fighters just go out there and just totally, you know, totally bomb. And, you know, who knows? Again, and, you know, I preach it's not what we know, it's what we don't know that hurts us. And, you know, sometimes I think maybe there was something there with Phil Davis. And, well, there was something that wasn't there with Phil Davis, and it wasn't that spark. It was, you know, it wasn't the Phil Davis that beat Gustafson, but they prepared. Anthony, you know, Johnson was prepared and, you know, again, I don't like to go back and rearview mirror it, but, you know, they did a tremendous job at his camp being prepared for Phil Davis, and you got to credit his trainers. I mean, I tell you, his conditioning was better. Everything was better. He looked, he looked really good. There's a lot, you know, there's a, a good upside, but at the same time, you can't discount his losses in the past. I mean, those those vulnerabilities are still going to be there. I thought they, you know, they were going to be there again. I Going into the third round, I still had a thought that maybe Phil Davis might be able to take him down and get something done. But he was totally prepared for it, and Phil apparently had one game plan, and hindsight being 100%, he got beat. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people liked Phil Davis. Phil Davis was a parlay buster along with, uh, with Feely against Max Holloway. Max, you know, that went from Max just... I mean, that crushed a lot of people. I think a it lot of people. Me, but Phil lot, Davis hurt me. I thought Phil Davis was going to win. A lot of people were hoping uh, that Tim Bosch was going to be that parlay buster. Instead, it ended up uh, being that Tim Bosch was the one that ended up getting I, busted up. Uh, so, yeah, Phil Davis ended up being the parlay buster. You mentioned Feely and Holloway, but it was such a short price right there, right? I mean, yeah, uh, I mean it, Holloway was plus, plus 20 cents, plus 120 or whatever. Davis cost me, too, because I was doing pretty well, Joey. And since I, I hit a couple of early parlays and I hit Max Holloway, as you and I did, had discussed on the radio, so I, I, hit, uh, I hit a couple of shots. We lost with Valley Flag in a very close fight, but I was doing well, and then I decided on the way out. I'm like, I'm not laying the juice with Jones outright, so I'll parlay it with Davis, and I ended up getting parlay busted there. I tell you, I got to hand it to Chris Beal. I, you know, I didn't see the groin shot when Patrick Williams kicked him and then took his back. I said, "Wow, this was," uh, you know, to quote people that, and, and when I hear it, it, it makes me cringe when they say "easy money." I mean, when he slapped on the rear naked choke, I, I thought that fight was going to be over in about thirty seconds. So I realized it was a, it was a knee to the groin that, that opened up that opportunity. Uh, but I tell you what, that Patrick Williams, if he gets. You know, he's, he, he had three losses for a reason, and, and I saw it in that fight. Chris Beal. He's got a bad chin, under. Joey. He's got a bad chin, uh, Williams. He got nailed. He lost a couple of fights ago. He got knocked out by a guy with like a 9-5 and five record. Not to take anything away from that guy. You know, it, it, his wrestling's good, Joey, but man, that stand-up. I've seen guys fighting outside of bars with better stand-up than Patrick Williams, his technique. It was like straight. Yeah, was, it was straight street fighting. He's running in the punches and stuff, man. Yeah, he was. He was kind of throwing, uh, 
I, I, if I, and it's, it's probably a really bad comparison, and uh, Corey, Corey will probably uh, shake his head at it, but I would compare his shots to, like, Prince Nazim, except without the <laughs> accuracy. I mean, he was throwing from all kinds of angles, yeah, it's weird. but he was just jumping into things, like punches and knees. And But you know what? I give the kid credit. The kid gave an honest fight. Oh, he's tough. And, uh, he's a I tough kid. Yeah. You know, I, this is a card where people shouldn't be cut. I mean, everybody performed on this card. It was I, I like the card. No, and I, and I, and I don't, I'm not criticizing the kid. The guy's obviously as tough as nails, the kid. He's got a ton of heart. But I'm just stating, like, yeah, he, he needs to work on some technique here. And I'm no coach. But, like you said, his sideways coming in sideways. And I love Rogan going, yeah, this guy's pretty unorthodox. Like, uh, how, how, you know, you never know what he's going to do. I don't think he knew what he was going to do before. And once Beal figured it out, that hey, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing standing up. And I'm going to be able to catch him. Yeah, I say send him over to AKA. I think AKA can. That I mean, that's a that's a pro, that's a testing ground over there because those guys over there are savages. And uh, so you know, I, I think that's a good a good spot for him to to learn or decide whether or not you know where where exactly he's going to be because you know a few losses. He's got what four losses now, and and we're, you know what's amazing? We're talking about a guy that's on fight pass, which is great. Yeah, for the for the UFC because that it got the kid the uh, Chris Beal. Props to him. He got the bonus and everything. Uh, you know, I, I think it's good when we could talk about two guys that people have never heard of coming into that fight. You know, nobody really knew who Patrick Williams was that didn't wrestle. Uh, Chris Beal, you know, in hindsight, people will say, yeah, well, he was 8 no, we knew this and that. But people really didn't see a lot of his fights. And it was tough to gauge by the quality of opposition. And that's something we deal with on a regular basis. Now, when he steps up to the next level, you know, it, above, you know, this was on Fight Pass for a reason because these were two new guys, despite the records. And uh, you know, when he steps up, he might be you know what we call a good fade in the future because he does have vulnerabilities. And if they move him too quick based on his devastating uh, knee, then there's a possibility that he gets beat. And as Patrick Williams might come back to superstar, I mean, he he had to learn from that fight. Joey Odessa with us. All right, Joe, we got to wrap it up. So just quickly in about a minute here, we got Bellator in Atlantic City in Jersey. Uh, last big fight at the Revel in, in Atlantic City was uh, Ray Rice versus his fiance. Ray Rice won TKO. Um, so we got uh, Joe Warren and Rafael Silva throwing it down here. Uh, what, what, what do you make of this Bellator card, Joey? Oh, well, you know, we know what we're getting with Warren. We're getting a wrestler that, uh, I mean, he won his last three, but, you know, he lost to Curran, he lost to uh, Villa. And Silva, I guess, on short notice, obviously, because Dantes is out. I'm I'm not going to lay two to one on Joe Warren, and I like wrestlers. I'm not saying run out and bet Rafael Silva, but you know I think that uh, I think you can make a case for Silva winning the fight. Joey Odessa, you can follow him on Twitter at MMA Odds. Uh, Joey, always a pleasure. We'll dive back into the UFC uh, next week, and we got the big Bellator pay per view that's rapidly uh, approaching as well. Always a pleasure, Joey. Hey, well, you left for. Our- but let leapfrogged over Floyd Mayweather. Oh, and of course. Well, yeah, Mayweather. Why, is he fighting Rousey this weekend? No. <laughs> no, he's not fighting Rousey, but he's fighting somebody that he'll probably beat. beat. You know what I mean? So I won't say you, as easily as he beat you, Rousey. Yeah, but. I, yeah, I was going to say that. You, I bet you think Rousey's got a better chance than Medina does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, maybe. <laughs> yes, actually, <laughs> uh, in an MMA fight, yeah. <laughs> but, uh... It's, it's horrible to, to, to even think about the guy fighting the girl and the punches and what he could do to her if he hit her, you know. But we went over that last week. But, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be a good fight. We saw some good fights. These Argentinian fighters are tough, but Floyd's going to beat him. Floyd will retire undefeated, and he good chance he'll stop him. You got a Kentucky Derby pick for us too, uh, Joey? I mean, NBA Finals? I mean, if you want me to, I could, I could fly with the Kentucky Derby. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, blindly, I mean, you know, just blindly, the six horse. The six horse. I'm going to mark that down. The six horse, says Odessa. Uh, I tell people just blindly bet on whoever won the uh, the Florida Derby. And that this year, that horse is Conquest. But uh, that's another story. Joey, it's always a pleasure, my man. Thanks for the time. Thank you, G. Have a good one. There's a Joey Odessa with us who, uh, Joey didn't want to say it, but it sounds like he thinks Rousey's got a better chance than Medina does. Uh, MMA Meltdown continues.
MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I am Gabriel Morenci. Let's get to our videos of the week. We were talking with John Ramdean about the upcoming Bellator pay-per-view. And, you know, considering we got Chandler and Alvarez, I really don't have a problem with what they're going to charge. And the undercard, undercard's interesting. And let's be honest, even though Rampage Jackson is past his, uh, his due date, you know, the fact of the matter is the dude is still entertaining. We got uh, his matchup against King Mo. We got some exclusive footage of, of Rampage Jackson in training for his big fight. And yes, that is Mayhem Miller, in case you were wondering. Seriously, this is, this is why when people, you know, are you excited about the Rampage fight? The dude's not even training. He's kind of training. I guess he's sort of training. He's training his wrestling, except not his wrestling wrestling. You know King Mo is actually a real Olympic wrestler, right, Rampage? You know, it's not fake wrestling. <laughs> it's real wrestling that could potentially happen. Yet, honestly, that's why we got to love uh, Rampage. All right, speaking of uh, loving fighters, I, you're going to be hard-pressed to find somebody more popular than Fedor. If you're wondering what Fedor is up to, Fedor is kicking it in Japan. And this, this clip once again proves why Japanese television is just so far superior to ours. This is what's going on in Japan. They got Fedor and some sort of glass octagon arm wrestling people. The crazy thing is, he's probably still making more money for this arm wrestling match than he would have in the UFC. <laughs> I'm just blown away by the coolness of the production of this thing. Eighty-six point two percent of the Japanese pub public believing Fedor will win. My money's on Fedor. He's thinking this is much easier than fighting. You get paid 50K, you beat someone like. The moral of this video is Fedor is just a badass no matter what he does. No matter what country he's in, he's just a, a badass. Now, this, I was kind of excited for this upcoming video when I saw this is the fastest fight in MMA history. Uh, it's debatable. We've got six and seven second fights. This is the fastest tap out in MMA history. Oh, no. Now, if that's what it takes to be a fighter, I can do that. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> that guy deserves to get beat on by every drunk in the stands. Every, every guy in the stands should be allowed to punch this guy in the face once uh, for that. I don't know what the motive was. And, it, you know, I don't think anyone's betting on that. It looks like, you know, it looks like a little regional, uh, regional uh, company or whatever. So I don't think anybody was betting on it. But nevertheless, people are paying to go see the fights, and you tap out like that. I think you deserve to get beat up in a parking lot. All right. Um, <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've got our uh, last uh, video of the week uh, here. Now, this one, uh, this one also from a, a regional fight company. And I don't know what the deal with this is. Like, because I didn't see how this guy gets hurt, but evidently he got hurt enough that he knocked himself out.
Like where, how do you not, where, where's the, like I, I don't understand, like how are you knocked out? What's up with all these loser fighters throwing fights, man? I, I thought that only, you know, big time fights were fixed. <laughs> I didn't know that, like, where did that guy get hurt? That's like, I've slipped on the ice harder than that. I didn't knock myself out. You threw a kick and you fell on your back. I don't understand the knockout part, you know? Uh, whatever. Uh, MMA meltdown on the Fight Network. <laughs>